Good morning, Fairlawn. Hey, you look pretty good for 80. Seriously. Church gets to be 80 years old. Well, a church doesn't get to be 80 years old by accident. Uh, your commitment, your faithfulness, um, your sacrifice. Uh, so one of, I guess one of the first things I want to do is say thank you. Thank you for modeling what it means for a church to be on mission, to hang in there when seasons are difficult so that we can rejoice when days of fruitfulness and blessing come. And my sense is that you're living in those days now, and I'm so very, very grateful for that. We're giving ourselves to three things on the Kansas City District these days, starting churches, strengthening churches, and developing leaders. 80 years from now, there will be three churches who will be celebrating their 80th anniversary. In the last, three year, or the last year, we've organized three churches. Uh, they'd been planted a few years ago and grew to a point where they were able to be self-sustaining and self-governing and self-propagating. So in the last year, we've organized churches in Lewisburg, Missouri, in Victory Hills at Hideaway Lakes in Polo, Missouri, and two weeks ago, organized Topeka Ebenezer, the first of what we hope will be at least three Spanish-speaking congregations here in Topeka. Demographics showed us a couple of years ago that 17% of Topeka is Spanish-speaking, which really surprised me. And then I started driving around and saw all these Mexican restaurants in Topeka, and I wasn't surprised anymore. I'm glad that 80 years ago, church planting was important on the Kansas City District, and that church planting was important to some folks at Topeka first. When you think about it, 1943 wasn't exactly the best of times to be planting a church. The world was at war. There were significant shortages here in the United States, and yet there were some men and women who felt compelled, felt called, had a passion to see other men and women come to faith in Jesus Christ and knew that would be most likely to happen if there was a new church in Topeka. And we celebrate that passion and that commitment this morning. Well, I love your pastor. I think God blessed this church when he led Brent Hewlett your way. My heart's just thrilled at the leadership that he's providing and at the love that I perceive that you have for him. But we all know he wouldn't be half the pastor he is were it not for Darla. So let's thank God for both of them. I have the privilege of uh, celebrating with churches when they have anniversaries and celebrations. In fact, some people say that uh, since I'm at, usually at a different church every Sunday, that I determine what church I'm going to be at by whether or not they're having food. <laughs> and you had food this morning, so here I am. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and to celebrate what God is doing. I've noticed as I'm with churches that are celebrating their anniversary that uh, usually they tell the story of their history in one of two ways, by the pastors that they've had or by the buildings that they've built. This morning, I'm going to suggest that maybe you could tell your story more appropriately based on the altars that you visited over the last 80 years. The very first altar in the Bible is built in Genesis chapter eight. And it's built by an interesting person. It's built by a person that's more famous for something else that he built. The first altar in the Bible was built by a man named Noah. Listen to this verse, Genesis chapter eight and verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The first thing Noah does when the ark comes to rest on the mountain, and the water has receded enough that he can get off the ark, the very first thing Noah does is build 
an altar. Which is really interesting when you think about it because you, do you recall how long it took Noah to build the ark? 120 years. As a pastor, I was involved in some building programs that felt like they were 120 years long. They weren't. But Noah's building program was 120 years. And you would think that the last thing he wanted to do when he got off the ark was to pick up a hammer and a saw again. But that's exactly what he does. And he builds this altar. And it has to do with salvation, this first altar. Diane and I grew up in a sleepy little river town in West Virginia. We met at the Nazarene church there. It was a great church. It was a small town, 3,000, 3,500 people, but it had a vibrant Nazarene church there. I started attending there when my mom and dad moved to that little town when I was five years old, and I, so I grew up in that church. And back then, at that church, the preachers that we had preached it hot. You know what I mean when I say they preached it hot? They were fiery. And just about every Sunday morning and Sunday evening service, yes, Sunday evening services, there were altar calls. At the end of the message, the pastor would give an altar call, and he'd have everybody stand, and he would ask us to close our eyes and bow our heads. But I'm just a kid, and I'm standing there gripping the pew in front of me, and I'm really curious about what's going on, so I didn't always keep my eyes shut. And it seemed like every time the pastor opened the altar and invited people to come forward, that somebody in that church would come forward. And as they would move forward to kneel at the altar, I'd be looking and I'd be thinking, I wonder what they did that was so bad that they have to tell God they're sorry right here in front of everybody. You see, there seemed to be a stigma attached to the altar those days, at least in my childish mind, that the altar was just a place for people to say they were sorry or to seek forgiveness from God or to invite Jesus into their heart. I didn't realize that the altar is, is, a, is a grace place. It's a place where we meet with God anywhere on our spiritual journey when we are especially in need of his grace. And then one Sunday night, the pastor had a stand and bow her heads and invited people to come forward who needed to pray. And that Sunday night, it was me. I knew in my heart, God's calling me to go forward. God's calling me to invite Jesus into my heart. God's calling me to be saved. It's interesting when Noah builds this first altar, he wasn't building it as a place to be saved. He'd already been saved. He and his family had already been saved. That ark that God had had him to build, which by the way, is a type of the New Testament church. Where God's, what God has provided for families to be saved in our day, the church. But Noah didn't build the altar is a place to be saved. Noah built the altar as a place to say, thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving my family. Across the 80 years, I don't know how many men and women, boys and girls, have knelt at altars at the Fairlawn Church of the Nazarene or the Albendale Church of the Nazarene. I don't know how many. Neither do I know how many have revisited an altar just to say, thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you for saving my family. I don't ever want to forget that I was lost. I was undone. I was headed for hell. My life had no purpose. I had no hope until I heard that Jesus had died for my sins and that if I invited him into my heart, he would change my life and transform the direction of my life. I don't ever want to forget. I want to live a life of gratitude. And so there are times when I need to visit an altar, to build an altar, just to say, thank you, God, for saving me. 
for saving my family. As far as we know, that's the only altar that Noah ever built. But there's a man in Genesis whose whole spiritual journey is marked by the altars that he builds, at least five altars that Abraham builds. Abraham's 75 years old. He's married. He has no children. And he's a pretty wealthy man. I kind of put that together in my head. He's wealthy, and he has no children. Maybe that goes, and he for sure doesn't have grandchildren. And I'll tell you, as bad as the children are on the pocketbook, the grandchildren are even worse on the pocketbook. So I'm experiencing. Abraham's 75 years old, and God comes to him one day and says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. But I need you to trust me, and I need you to go to the place I'm going to show you. I need you to be obedient and faithful enough and trust me enough to leave this place where you are, Haran, and go where I will lead you to the place where I'm going to bless you and make you the father of a mighty nation. In Hebrews, we read about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Can you imagine it? We live in the era of the GPS. We don't hardly go to Walmart without using our GPS. But here's Abraham called to go to a place, another nation, not knowing where it is, not knowing the name of the place. God's just saying to Abraham, do you trust me enough day by day that you will allow me to lead you because I'm going to take you to a place where I'm going to bless you? And Abraham does it. He gathers together his servants, his flocks, his herds. He gathers everything together and he hits the road. And he doesn't get far on his journey before we get to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Abraham built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him and who was guiding him. Sometimes we need to visit an altar because we need guidance. We need direction in our lives. Diane and I had been married for six weeks when we loaded up all of our possessions and put them in the back of a rented U-Haul truck. And it was about the smallest truck you could rent because we didn't have much. We'd been married for six weeks. We had some furniture Furniture that our parents had given us, hand-me-downs. We'd collected a few things. We left on a Thursday morning. We left Payton City, West Virginia. My mom and dad, Diane's mom and dad, we stood there in front of the U-Haul truck. Our car was on a dolly behind the truck. We all, the six of us, held hands. Our parents prayed for us, kind of patted us on the head, and off we went 800 miles to Kansas City, a place neither of us had ever been. This was before Google, before the internet, before smartphones. We had $700 cash, no credit cards. We did not know where we were going to live. We didn't know where we were going to work. We only knew that God was calling us to Kansas City because I needed to go to Nazarene Theological Seminary. I'd graduated from college, was actually waiting on Diane to graduate from high school. That'll tell you a little bit of difference, a little bit about the difference in our ages. Worked at a church for two years, about an hour away from Diane. Those two years had shown me that I needed more education if I was going to be of any value to the church. I needed more education, so I was assured that I needed to go to Nazarene Theological Seminary. But we didn't know where we were going to live, where we were going to work. And my mom and dad and Diane's mom and dad say a prayer of God's blessing, pat us on the head, and send us on the road. I still can't believe they did that. (laughs) If it was their grandchildren, I assure you they wouldn't have done that. (laughs) We had $700. And I had a handful of McDonald's coupons. 
it was the summer of 1984, and the, the summer of 1984 was a year of summer Olympics. And McDonald's was doing this promotional campaign. They've never done anything like it since because I think they lost their shirt on this promotional campaign. But they would hand out coupons. And you would scratch off the coupon and it would reveal an Olympic event. Some of you might remember this. You'd walk into the lobby of a McDonald's and there'd be a display there of all the Olympic events. And if the United States won a gold medal and you had that event on your coupon, you got a Big Mac. If they won a silver medal, you got fries. If they won a bronze medal, you got a Coke. And a friend of mine from Parkersburg, West Virginia, as a wedding gift, had given me a handful of these McDonald's coupons. <laughs> so we hit the road from Peyton City, West Virginia. It's pretty easy. You go north about 40 miles. You hit I-70, and then you travel west. And you don't really need a map. You just, you just drive 70 west until you smell the barbecue, and then you know you're in Kansas City. So... At lunchtime on that Thursday, we found ourselves in Dayton, Ohio, and we're looking for the golden arches. And we pull into the parking lot, and we walk into the lobby, and we're looking at the display, and we're going through our little coupons, and we see uh, a gold medal, bronze medal, silver medal, and we find it again, and I'm thinking, okay, can we just redeem one, or can we redeem more than one? So I go to the counter, and I ask them, and they said, well, you can redeem three, and she can redeem three. So I got my Big Mac Coke and fries. Diane got Big Mac Coke and fries, and this is wonderful. We get back on 70. We make our way across Indiana. We're about at the Indiana-Illinois border, and we're looking for McDonald's, and we do the very same thing for dinner. We drive until it's dark. We find a cheap hotel on the interstate. It was cheap. It was flea-ridden. It was horrible. But when we got up in the morning in the little lobby area there, they had these cellophane-wrapped bear claws, which I used to be able to eat, and I loved those things. So we had a free breakfast, and we drive on to the other side of St. Louis for lunch, and we hit the McDonald's again, and now we're pulling into Kansas City, into the parking lot of Nazarene Theological Seminary, late afternoon on Friday. And I walk in to meet the registrar. And I introduce myself and tell him while I'm there, I'm there to register for classes. And he says, do you realize classes start Monday morning? I said, yes, that's why I'm here, Friday afternoon. <laughs> so he says, well, let me see what I've got on you. And he goes to his file cabinet and he looks down through and he says, I, I don't have anything on you. I said, I know. I'm here to register today. So he gets out his little clipboard, and he starts filling out the lines, and he asks me, okay, what's your address? Don't know. Okay. What's your employment? Don't know. Okay. Well, do you, do you know what classes you need? Oh, yeah. I said, I, I got a catalog. I know what classes I need. And so I told him the classes that I wanted. And he looks it over, and then he says, that'll be, and he tells me how much I owe him. And it's a few hundred dollars, and it's eaten into my $700 that I've only had to use for gas at that point. And I peel off a few hundred dollar bills, and I give him. Now, looking back, I realize I didn't have a job. I didn't have an address. The man was thinking, if he's got any money on him, get it now. <laughs> and then he said, where are you going to stay tonight? I said, I, I really don't know. I was going to ask you if you could recommend a cheap place around here somewhere. He said, well, no, actually... There's a place right next door here called the King Conference Center, and students like you that are coming to seminary, we put them up for a couple of nights free. Oh, I said, we're very interested in that. We found a church to go to on Sunday morning. The Sunday school teacher and his wife invited us home for lunch. It was huge for us. Monday morning, Diane found a job 
a place she would work for the next three years. That morning, I started my seminary career, and that afternoon, I found a job. And God was teaching Eddie and Diane that when he calls you to do something, he might not tell you what it's going to look like on the other side, but you can trust him. He will take care of you. I don't know where you're at this morning in your journey. Maybe the whole reason you're here this morning is to hear me tell you that if God is asking you to do something, you don't need to know what the destination's going to look like. It'll be far better than you could ever imagine. And you can trust him on the journey to provide. God used a promotion from McDonald's and the athleticism of United States Olympic athletes to feed us all the way to Kansas City. And God has used so many things over the years that we would never have imagined or anticipated to provide for us and to bless us. And he'll do the same for you. And I think that that day, on his journey, Abraham said, I am just so thankful that God's with me on this journey, that he's protecting me, that he's providing for me. I need to build an altar to say, thank you, God, for being with me on the journey. And that's exactly what he does in chapter 12 and verse 7. And the amazing thing is, the very next altar that Abraham builds is the same chapter, chapter 12, and the next Verse, verse 8. From there, Abraham went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. From Shechem to Bethel is about 20 miles. It's about a one-day journey. And it's as though Abraham is saying, God, I don't ever want to get far from your presence. I want to stay so very, very close to you. I had an altar yesterday that I visited. I know that, God, but it's today. And today I want to be just as close to you or closer than I was yesterday. So I'm going to build an altar today. Eighty years. How many Sundays is that? It's a lot. I'd add it up real quick in my mind, but I went to school in West Virginia, and so it might not be exactly right. That's a lot of Sundays. That's a lot of opportunities to visit an altar. And this morning, if there's been a time in your life when you were closer to God than you are today, God hasn't moved. The altars haven't moved. And he invites us to draw near to him so he can draw near to us. Our lives can always be warm. This relationship can always be warm with God. There's no reason to grow cold in our faith. And we have altars in our churches to make sure, to ensure that that does not happen. Well, there's a couple more altars that Abraham builds, but we're going to skip over those and go to the last altar that Abraham builds. It's in chapter 22 and verse 9. Abraham arrives at the destination that God had in mind for him. And sure enough, he and Sarah have a son, Isaac. It's the son of promise. It's the child of promise. He's the apple of Abraham's eye. Abraham is 100 years old when Isaac is born. Sarah is 90 years old when Isaac is born. And they love that boy. And then one day, God comes to Abraham and says, I need to make sure that the gift I've given you hasn't become more important to you than the giver of the gift. I need you to build another altar, Abraham, and this time I want you to place on that altar the thing in your life that you love most. It becomes for Abraham an altar of consecration, of entire surrender. And there will come a point in 
all of our spiritual journeys, when God calls us to that altar, that altar of complete concentration, of entire devotion, of entire sanctification, when God asks us to give him not just our sin, not just our shame, not just our problems or our burdens or our illnesses or our sickness, when God calls us to give him everything, bad and good, hopes and dreams and joys and the things in life that bring us the most happiness and contentment. There comes a time in our spiritual journey when God says, I have given you all of me. I want all of you. And the question once again becomes, how much do you trust God? That's the question for Abraham. How much do you trust God? And Abraham builds an altar. And on that altar, he places Isaac. It's an amazing story. But it's a story, once again, not only of God's call in our life, but of God's provision. He makes a way. He always makes a way. And he makes a way once again for Abraham. I'm grateful that over the last 80 years, the pastors of this church, evangelists that you've had, special speakers that you've had, have continually reminded us that we have an altar in the Church of the Nazarene. It's a place of grace. That no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, this is an altar that's a place where you can find help for the journey, food for your soul, where you can find direction in life. I was born on a Sunday. The very next Sunday, my mom and dad had me at church and stood in front of an altar and dedicated me to the Lord. When I was a child of eight or nine, I knelt at an altar, confessed my sins, and invited Jesus Christ into my heart. As a teenager at a youth camp in Summersville, West Virginia, on a Thursday night, the preacher had preached the message, and then he opened the altar. He invited teenagers to come forward who needed to pray, and I knew I needed to come forward. But I didn't know why. I'd been to the altar the night before and confessed all my sins, and my goodness, how much trouble can you get in at a church camp? Well, actually, you can get in a lot of trouble at a church camp, but I hadn't that last 24 hours, so I wondered why in the world does God want me to go to the altar, but I stepped out in faith, and when I knelt, I knew God was calling me to the ministry. I had never even considered it, had not been on my radar, but that call became very real and very vivid that night. As a student at Mount Vernon Nazarene University at a fall revival, I became convinced of my self-centeredness and selfishness and that God was calling me to give myself completely to him, which I did. Diane and I were married at an altar in the Church of the Nazarene. We dedicated our boys at an altar at a Church of the Nazarene. And almost every significant spiritual event, every transforming moment in my life has taken place at an altar. And I'm wondering if maybe this morning you'd like to visit an altar. Maybe this is the morning you confess your sins and invite Jesus into your heart and experience his transformation. Or maybe that happened 15 or 50 years ago, but today you're reminded of what God has done for you and you want to visit an altar just to say thank you for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving my family. Or maybe you're at a place on your spiritual journey where you really need God's direction. You need his provision. Or you need to thank him for his direction or provision. Or maybe this morning, you're at the place in your spiritual journey when God's calling you to give all, to give everything. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand, and then I'm going to invite you to come and pray.
to come and make use of this altar. I'd like to pray with you, and I'd like to pray for you. And if you want to come and use the altar, I'm especially going to pray for you this morning. Would you join me in standing? Now I just invite you to step out. We won't wait but for a minute or two, but just invite you to step out. If you'd like to make use of the altar this morning, I'd like to pray for you. Amen. God is so good. Are there others? Pause for just another moment. Hey, if you need to come, God's always faithful. You you feel it in your heart. You know it. So I just ask you to be obedient. Just step out. He wants to bless you. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the faithfulness of a church over 80 years. Thank you for pastors who have served this church. Thank you for messages that have been preached, care that has been given. I I, I suppose, Lord, that we, we could do our best to kind of tally up the impact a church like this has made, but... We'd always fall far short because only eternity is going to reveal all the good that has been produced by the ministry of this church. Lives that have been changed, marriages that have been healed, trajectories that have been set right. We just want to give you thanks, Lord. And over the years, thank you that this church has had an altar, has provided a a special place where folks could come and pray a grace place where we could experience your grace and transforming moments would happen on this transforming journey that you've called us to. Thank you for the men and women, boys and girls who have found Jesus Christ to be their personal Savior in this church, who have believed in Jesus, who have recognized him as Lord, believe that he was raised from the dead, Thanks for the transformation that has taken place at these altars. Thanks for folks who have knelt here when they were burdened by children who were wayward or relationships that were frayed or who needed your touch physically and were seeking healing or who had decisions to make and just didn't know the right decision to make and were seeking your counsel and your direction. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that folks have have heard from you and from your spirit and who have, have experienced your grace. And then, Lord, thanks for a church that has preached that you call us to live holy lives, lives that are pleasing to you, and that there will come a point in all of our spiritual journeys when you ask for all of us. It's as though you, you don't just ask us to put our checkbook or our credit card or our bank account on the altar, you invite us to crawl up on the altar ourselves and present ourselves as living sacrifices to be made holy by your grace. Thank you for those individuals over the years who've surrendered everything to you and for how you've used them in mighty ways and in the future for other men and women, boys and girls, who will begin to live the blessed life of entire consecration, entire sanctification because of a transforming moment at this altar. Well, Lord, our hearts are filled with gratitude this morning. Thanks for all you've done to bless the church. And most of all, thank you for the friendships that have developed as we've walked this journey together in this church. We pray this prayer in the strong name of Jesus Christ and all the people said, amen, amen. Would you remain standing as the pastor comes? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Estep. Darla's going to lead us in a chorus that uh, we don't have the words on the screen, but you'll know exactly the words of the family of God. But it's awful hard.
to sing a song about how thankful we are with each other and with God, being so separated from each other. So I'd like to invite you to take the hand of the person beside you, and I'd like for you to begin crossing the aisles. If you're kind of close to people, if you'll get closer to them, and if you need to cross aisles to hold hands, let's, let's join hands as we sing this song, as we conclude our, our celebration song. Darla's going to lead us in, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family. Receive this benediction also from Solomon as he prayed for God's blessing on the new sanctuary. He said, May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, decrees, and laws he gave our ancestors. So now, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, for he's already gone before you. You're dismissed, my friends. Have a wonderful day.